I began to realize that the evidence uh, for the existence of God, while not proof, was actually pretty interesting. And it certainly made me realize that atheism would no longer be for me an acceptable choice, that it was the least rational of the option. Today I'm going to share with you this very powerful video of a scientist who is named Francis Collins. He worked on the Human Genome Project and in this video he shares exactly why he left atheism and embraced Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. But I want to ask you to please stick all the way until the end because I'll very quickly be explaining how everything he says ties back to the Bible. Watch this. I won't go through the whole chronology as it actually happened, but let me summarize for you the kinds of arguments that ultimately brought me around to the position of recognizing that belief in God was an entirely satisfying intellectually uh, event, but also something that I was increasingly discovering I had a spiritual hunger for. And interestingly, some of the pointers to God had been in front of me all along, coming from the study of nature. And I hadn't really thought about them, but here they were. Here's one which seems like an obvious statement, but maybe it's not so obvious. There is something instead of nothing. No reason that should be. This phrase of Wigner, the Nobel laureate in physics, caught my eye because I had been involved, of course, as a graduate student working with quantum mechanics with Schrodinger's equation. And one of the things that had appealed to me so much about mathematics and physics and chemistry was how it was that this particular kind of depiction of matter and energy works. I mean, it really works well. And a theory that is correct often turns out to be simple and beautiful. And why should that be? Why should mathematics be so unreasonably effective in describing nature? Hmm. There's the Big Bang. The fact that the universe had a beginning, as virtually all scientists are now coming to the conclusion, about 13.7 billion years ago in an unimaginable singularity where the universe, smaller than a golf ball, suddenly appeared and then began flying apart and has been flying apart ever since. And we can calculate that singularity by noticing just how far those galaxies are receding from us and things like the background microwave radiation, the echo of that Big Bang. And of course that presents a difficulty because our science cannot look back beyond that point. And it seems that something came out of nothing. Well, nature isn't supposed to allow that. So if nature is not able to create itself, how did the universe get here? You can't postulate that that was created by some natural force or you haven't solved the problem because then, okay, what created that natural force? So the only plausible, it seemed to me, explanation is that there must be some supernatural force that did the creating. And of course, that force would not need to be limited by space or even by time. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. So, all right, let's imagine there is a creator, let's call that creator God, who is supernatural, who's not bounded by space, not bounded by time, and is a pretty darn good mathematician. And <laughs> it's starting to make some sense here. Well, God must also be an incredible physicist. Because another thing I began to realize by a little more reading is that there is this phenomenal fine-tuning of the universe that makes complexity and therefore life possible. Those of you who study uh, physics and chemistry will know that there's a whole series of laws that govern the behavior of matter and, matter and energy. They are simple beautiful equations but they have constants in them like the gravitational constant or the speed of light and you cannot derive at the present time the value of those constants. They are what they are. They're givens. You have to do the experiment and measure them. Well, suppose they were a little different. Would that matter? Would anything change in our universe if the gravitational constant was a little stronger or a little weaker? Some days I think it's a little stronger, but I don't think it really is. <laughs> so that calculation got done, particularly in the 1970s, uh, by Barrow and Tipler. And the answer was astounding, that if you take any of these 15 constants, and you tweak them just a tiny little bit, the whole thing doesn't work anymore. Take gravity, for instance. If gravity was just one part in about 10 billion weaker than it actually is, then after the Big Bang, there would be insufficient gravitational pull to result in the coalescence of uh, stars and galaxies and planets and you and me. 
And you'd end up, therefore, with an infinitely expanding sterile universe. If gravity was just a tiny bit stronger, well, things would coalesce all right, but a little too soon. And the Big Bang would be followed after a while by a big crunch. And we would not have the chance to appear uh, because the timing wouldn't be right. And that's just one example. You can't look at that data and not marvel at it. It is astounding to see the knife edge of improbability upon which our existence exists. So what's that about? Well, I can think of three possibilities. First of all, maybe theory will someday tell us that these constants have to have the value they have, that there is some a priori reason for that. Most physicists I talk to don't think that's too likely. There might be relationships between them that have to be maintained, but not the whole thing. A second possibility. Perhaps we are one of an almost infinite series of other universes that have different values of those constants. And of course, we have to be in the one where everything turned out right or we wouldn't be having this conversation. So that's the multiverse hypothesis, and it is a defensible one, as long as you're willing to accept the fact that you will probably never be able to observe those infinite series of other parallel universes. So that requires quite a leap of faith. The third possibility is that this is intentional, that these constants have the value they do because that creator God who is a good mathematician, also knew that there was an important set of dials to set here if this universe that was coming into being was going to be interesting. So take those three possibilities, and which of them seems most plausible? Apply Occam's razor, if you will, which says that the simplest explanation is most likely correct. Well, I come down on number three, especially because I've already kind of gotten there in terms of the other arguments about the idea of a creator. And this is interesting, but of course, so far, how far have we gotten? We've gotten to Einstein's God now, because Einstein certainly marveled at the way in which mathematics worked. Einstein was not aware, as far as we know, of the fine-tuning arguments at quite this level, but probably would have embraced them in the same way. But we haven't really gotten to a theist God yet. We've gotten to a deist God, so how do we get there? Well, now we come back to Lewis in that first chapter of Mere Christianity, which is called Right and Wrong as a Clue to the Meaning of the Universe. And here what is being talked about is the moral law. Now, I didn't take philosophy in college, so I didn't really quite know what this was all about. But as I began to recognize what the argument was, it rang true. It rang true in a really startling way. One of those things where you realize, I've known about this all my life, but I've never really quite thought about it. So what's the argument? The argument is that we humans are unique in the animal kingdom by apparently having a law that we are under, although we seem free to break it because uh, that happens every day. And the law is that there's something called right and there's something called wrong, and we're supposed to do the right thing and not the wrong thing. Again, we break that law. When we do, what do we do? We make an excuse which only means we believe the law must be true and we're trying to be let off the hook. Now people will quickly object, now wait a minute, I can think of human cultures that did terrible things, how can you say they were under the moral law? Well if you go and study those cultures, you will find out that the things that we consider terrible were in their column called right because of various cultural expectations. So clearly the moral law is universal, but it is influenced in terms of particular actions and how they size up in the right and wrong assessment. Well, the moral law sometimes calls us to do some pretty dramatic things, particularly in terms of altruism, where you do something sacrificial for somebody else. And what about that? People may argue, and they have, and they will continue to, that this can all be explained by evolution, and those are useful arguments to look at. So for instance, if you're being altruistic uh, to your own family, you can see how that might make sense from an evolutionary perspective because they share your DNA. So if you're helping their DNA survive, well, it's yours too. And so that makes sense from a Darwinian argument about reproductive fitness. If you are being nice to somebody in expectation, they'll be nice to you later. A reciprocal form of altruism, well, okay, you could see how that might also make sense in terms of benefiting your reproductive success. 
You can even make arguments, as Martin Nowak has at Harvard, that if you do computer modeling of things like the prisoner's dilemma, you can come up with motivations for entire groups to behave altruistically toward each other. But a consequence of that, and all the other models that have been put together, is that you still have to be hostile to people who are not in your group. Otherwise, the whole thing falls apart as far as the evolutionary drive for successful competition. Well, does that fit? Is that what we see in our own experience? Where are those circumstances where we think the moral law has been most dramatically at work? I would submit they are not when we're being just nice to our family or just nice to people who are going to be nice to us or even just when we're being nice to other people in our own group. The things that strike us, that cause us to marvel and to say, that's what human nobility is all about, are when that radical altruism extends beyond those categories. When you see Mother Teresa and the streets of Calcutta picking up the dying, when you see Oscar Schindler risking his life to save Jews from the Holocaust, when you see the Good Samaritan, or when you see Wesley Autry. Wesley Autry, a construction worker, African-American, standing on the subway platform in New York City, and next to him, a young man, a graduate student, went into an epileptic seizure. And to the horror of everybody standing there, the student fell onto the tracks in front of an oncoming train. Uh, with only a split second to make a decision, Wesley jumped onto the tracks as well, pulled the student, still having the seizure, in that small space in between the tracks, covered him with his own body, and the train rolled over both of them. And miraculously, there was just enough clearance uh, for them both to survive. And here's a picture of the next day, as Wesley describes the situation standing next to the young man's father. This was clearly radical altruism. These people were of uh, no acquaintance of each other, had no uh, likelihood of seeing each other in any other circumstance, and belonged to different uh, groups as we seem to define them here in our society, one being African American, one being white. And yet, New York went crazy, <laughs> and they should. What an amazing act. What an amazing, risky thing to do. Now, evolution would say, Wesley, you, what were you thinking? Talk about ruining your reproductive fitness opportunities. <laughs> this is a scandal, isn't it? So think about that. Again, I'm not offering you a proof, but I do think when people try to argue that morality can be fully explained on evolutionary grounds, that's a little bit too easy. That's a little bit too much of a just-so story. And perhaps it might ought to be thought about as potentially having some other reflected uh, reason for its presence. And I would ask the question, because Lewis asked it in his chapter, if you were looking not just for evidence of a God who was a mathematician and a physicist, but a God who cared about human beings and who stood for what was good and holy and wanted his people to also be interested in what is good and holy, wouldn't it be interesting to find written in your own heart this moral law which doesn't otherwise make sense and which is calling you to do just that? That made a lot of sense to me. So after going through these arguments over the course of a couple of years, and it was that long, fighting them, uh, oftentimes wishing that I had never started down this road because it was leading me a place I wasn't sure I wanted to go, I began to realize that I had a certain series of immutable issues that were leading me in the direction of awe, awe of something greater than myself, reflected here uh, by this uh, phrase uh, from Immanuel Kant, the philosopher. Two things fill me with constantly increasing admiration and awe. The longer and more earnestly I reflect on them, the starry heavens without and the moral law within. My goodness, that's just where I was. But I had to figure out then, okay, if there is the possibility of this kind of God and a God who cares about humans, what is that God really like? And now it was time to go back to the world's religions and try to figure out what they tell us about that. And as I read through them, now somewhat better prepared, I could see there were great similarities between the great monotheistic religions, and they 
actually resonated uh, quite well with each other about many of the principles, and I found that quite gratifying and was a bit surprised because I had assumed that they were radically different. But there were differences. Now, about this time, I had also arrived at a point that was actually not comforting, which was the realization that if the moral law was a pointer to God, and if God was good and holy, I was not. And as much as I tried to forgive myself for actions that were not consistent with that moral law, they kept popping up. And therefore, just as I was beginning to perceive the person of God in this sort of blurry way, that image was receding because of my own failures. And I began to despair of whether this would ever be a relationship that I could claim or hope to have because of my own shortcomings. And into that area of increasing anxiety came the realization that there is a person in one of these faiths who has the solution to that. And that's the person of Jesus Christ, who not only claimed to know God, but to be God, and who in this amazing and incomprehensible at first, but ultimately incredibly sensible uplifting, sacrificial act, died on the cross and then rose from the dead to provide this bridge between my imperfections and God's holiness in a way that made more sense than I ever dreamed it could. I had heard those phrases about Christ died for your sins and I thought that was so much gibberish and suddenly it wasn't gibberish at all. Even though he said so many incredible and powerful things that we can relate to the Bible, I specifically want to focus on what he said about morality and tie that in with scripture. Romans 2 verses 14 through to 15 says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. This for me is just so powerful and it confirms exactly what he teaches. As a society, we do know what is right and wrong because God has written his laws in our hearts. But here is where the challenge comes in and I want to read you this passage from Romans 1 verses 18. This is what it says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth this is exactly what we need to understand yes god has written his laws in our hearts and we have the sense of morality knowing what's right and wrong but we can suppress god's laws that are written in our hearts and we can suppress the truth because it offends us and we don't want to live that way because it contradicts our flesh but this is what i want you to understand once you truly give your life to christ and you repent of your sins and you submit everything you are to jesus and you believe in the finished work on the cross and through his resurrection you become an entirely new person with new desires so you would once again have your morality your moral compass completely renewed he completely changes and transforms your heart and you want to live honor and serve God. So to everyone watching this video who hasn't given their lives to Christ and you feel like I have suppressed God's law in my heart so much, I have completely shifted away from God's ways. I want to tell you it is not too late. You can give your life to Christ today and he will transform you and make you a completely new person. God bless.